Jane Trigere. This is Talking Art. And we're sitting here in the Deerfield Arts Bank with our next guest, who is Barry Moser. Uh, every week we bring you a different local artist and try to ask questions that you would want to know. And if there are questions that I'm not asking, please give them, send them to me at the uh, email down below and I will make sure to include them. Um, Barry Moser is a very well-known artist nationally, internationally, and happens to live in our area. And we're going to find out why, and then we're going to find out a little bit about his history in terms of his art and, um, and anything else that comes along the way, especially how he makes his art. Barry, welcome. Thank you, Jane. Good to be here. <laughs> so, um, I've asked you to uh, bring a bunch of things here. They're all in front of us here and behind us. And, but I like to start by asking, you're not local, are you? Um, well, yes, I've been here for nearly 50 years, <clears throat> but I was not born here. And I, where were you born? I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, 1940. Uh-huh. Yeah. And how did you get from Chattanooga to here? I Is needed it? a job and I needed to get out of the, needed to get out of the South. I moved up here in 1967, which was at the sort of the high point of the civil rights movement. And I, uh, <clears throat> I just didn't have the courage of my convictions. So instead of going to Mississippi and Alabama to help register voters, I moved north with my family and became an expatriate. Because yeah. I still consider myself a southerner, um, even though I'm, I'm born again Yankee. <clears throat> I, my roots are in the south and I, you can't escape that. You know. I'm culturally a southerner. Well, your accent... I don't have an accent. Yes, you do. No, you do, but I don't. Oh, okay. Well, my accent is not the same as your accent. That's true. Okay. That's true. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, you're prolific, but when did you start doing art? Oh, well, like everybody, I started drawing when I was very young, you know, in, in elementary school. Before that, drawing on my mama's walls. So I mean I don't I really don't make that much of a distinction as, as to um, when I started making art. I'm not even sure that I do make art. Art's a very big word for me, so I don't refer to myself as an artist. Ever. You don't? No, never. What and do you refer to yourself as? A printmaker or a, 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 print a designer, a, an illustrator, whatever. I, I, I define myself by what I do. I mean, artist is a huge word. For me to say that I am an artist, that means I am equating myself with the likes of Katie Kolovitz, with Rembrandt, um, and, you know, with, with Jasper Johnson, the list. I just, but I'm not going to do that. You want to call me that? Fine. I'm not going to correct you. Okay, I'll call you a printmaker. Fine. That's All why right. I'm more comfortable with that. So when did so. printmaking start? Printmaking started when I was in Chattanooga. I was trying to teach myself how to make an etching. And I had succeeded in so far as learning, as making a plate. But then when I went to print the etching, I had no print and I had no etching press. So I put it between two pieces of plywood with a piece of dampened paper and a piece of felt and drove my car over. Did it work? Didn't work. Mm -hmm. And it ended up with a dirty piece of paper. That was that was it. On both sides, dirty probably. No, well, no, it was nice and clean because it was sandwiched in between felt, you know, and uh -huh. all that. But it just didn't work. Um, I tried to make a woodcut. Can you explain why it wouldn't work? Because hmm? there's not enough pressure. Work? The car is not, not heavy enough. The car is not heavy enough. No, it's because it's, the, the pressure is distributed over too great an area. The pressure to print an etching has to be in a line, and it's about I forget now about 1,500 pounds a square per linear inch. As as the, as roller, the roller goes over, over it. it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, has an enormous amount of pressure. Oh. And I also tried to teach myself how to make a woodcut because I, I graduated from the University of Chattanooga, now the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and I, there was no one in, at UC at the time that knew anything about printmaking, so there was were nobody you, who could teach me anything. Were you in the art department? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was trained as a painter, uh -huh. and I, but I had an affinity um, since 19, what, 1958 when I discovered the work of Leonard Baskin. I had an affinity towards printmaking, especially wood, woodcuts and so forth. <clears throat> and I tried to teach myself how to make one, not with very much success, I might add. You know, cut it on a drawing board, uh -huh. which isn't terrible, but uh, uh -huh. it was just a terrible image. Well, I'm looking over the pieces that we have here. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could walk through some sure, of them. Sure, absolutely. So the first one here, uh, I don't know that you have a title for it. Do you? I, I have no title. I, I see 
in order not to be biased here, I see a group of round objects. That's right. Is that fair? Or round shapes. Round That's shapes, it, yeah. right. Yeah. So, or ovoid shapes would be a more accurate term. Ovoid shapes, yeah. okay. And that's an etching or a drawing? No, it's a drawing, pen and ink drawing. That's a pen and ink yep. drawing. And I think the date on it is 1966 or something like that. What, have you, what had you been doing up until 1966? A lot of work like this, as well as a lot of very tedious um, drawing, um, you know, little, I'm, I'm, it's embarrassing to me now, but things like, you know, almost like covered bridges and that kind of thing, though growing up in the South there were no covered bridges. But wells and all kinds of various things. But I, this was where I really was oriented to work without subject matter. Local structures that were not necessarily architectural was yeah, what attracted yeah, your attention. Something like I that. I think that yeah, attracts yeah. a lot of people's attention. And uh, geologic formations uh -huh. as well. So this is not geological. This no, is out of your mind. It just totally invented. Uh -huh. yep. it, it, it has an etching quality to oh, it, it, right? Yeah, you could translate that into an etching very easily. All right, so this is early and you left this behind. Pretty well, in a, in a sense, I left it behind in that I did go back to uh, in, incorporating uh, subject matter in my work, but um, because I think all art is abstract. I mean, no matter what, uh, anytime you take an object that's in three dimensions and you deprive it of one of its dimensions, you have abstracted it. And when you take a three-dimensional object and put it into two dimensions, uh, and it's also, no matter what one is doing, I mean, I think it was Clive Bell who said in his, his seminal work, uh, Art, the title, published in 1914, he said, subject matter in art may or may not be harmful, but always it is irrelevant. 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 And, I, and James Whistler was of, of the same mind. He said uh, something to the effect that um, if people could care for painting as painting, uh, and not, uh, they shouldn't confuse it with things that have nothing at all to do with it, like patriotism, love, pity, uh, piety, and the, and the like. It so it is, should not represent something other than what it simply is. It's paint on canvas is what it is. And that drawing that we're looking at is ink on paper. Ink on paper. Well, that's all it is. It can never be anything more than that. If you have an, if you have an image of an apple <clears throat> and um, you say, oh, what a lovely apple, that is illogical. In order for it to be logical, you would have to be able to take an apple and look at an apple and say, what a lovely picture that is. It doesn't work. Right. So it is a picture, it is a representation of an apple. It is right. not an apple. Right. It's the Magritte painting. Uh, right. You know, the, this, this right. is not a pipe. This is not a pipe. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> moving along a little bit sure. of time here, I see <clears throat> something that looks completely different. Mm -hmm. How much time has elapsed between this oh, ovoid 66, ink to this watercolor of a sunset. Oh, six, 40 years. 40 years, mm -hmm. and you've brought me nothing between these 40 years. Do you want to tell me what you were doing between <laughs> those 40 years? Uh, producing about, um, oh, good God, over 300 books in those 40 years. Illustrating books. Illustrating and designing books, yeah. Okay, so the, the, the books that you call designing books, these are your inventions of something you want to do, and illustrating books might be something that somebody has asked you to do? No, I design and illustrate. If I'm gonna illustrate, if I take a commission from a publisher, like yes. Harcourt Brace or somebody, um, to illustrate a book, I always demand that I design it as well. Because oh. the design of the book, the typographic design, always for me, always comes first. And were you able to do that right from the beginning? Yeah, pretty much so. Because my first commission from a from a trade publisher came after I had done thirty or forty uh, books under my imprint, Penny Royal Press. So tell us about Penny Royal Press. Well, Penny Royal Press is a is the name of Penny Royal comes from a plant, uh, Penny Royal, which is associated with witches' gardens and. Um, Printing itself in its, in its, uh, in its infancy um, was called the black art, uh, just like witchcraft was called the black art. And uh, printing was considered by the church to be a part of witchcraft and all of this because it was making uh, the, the holy, it was making holy writ available to common people mm -hmm. and not just the clerics. Mm -hmm. And so um, I adopted that name and I also have to say that David Godin and I were working at the same time uh, with Harold McGrath and, and Lenny Baskin 
And he had started his press, and he called it the Mandragora Press. And Mandragora is the Latin name for the mandrake plant, which is, you know, has all kinds of evil and darkness associated with it. But Godin ended up calling his press David Godin. David R. Godin, publisher. Yes, yes indeed. Um, he but, went for his name. Uh, yeah, but that was before he established his printing, his publishing company of David R. Godin. But his first yeah. imprint was Mandragora. Uh -huh. So I followed along in his footsteps. But you didn't and switch and start calling it by your name. No, and I wish I had. You, ha you do. I, I do wish I had because I could have capitalized on the, the very wonderful printer in Maine, Thomas Bird Mosier. Oh. <laughs> but he spelled, he, but he, he spelled it with an H. Well, I, a different spell. But I could have capitalized on that a little bit, but I wasn't smart enough at the time. And once you've published ten or twelve books under an imprint, you, you can't change it. No, no. You know, so um, so that's the origins of it. It's just the name of my of my private press, uh, which is, as I was saying, it, it, not to be confused with a vanity press. No, I, I think we understand and that. Private but... presses produce. Um, fine books, handmade books, yes. and they have come yeah. off as usually being very so, expensive. So all of this work then that we're, um, from, the, from, from this one here that we're about to, we're going to continue talking mm -hmm. about, from then on is over here in, in this area, in yes, the Northampton area. pretty much so. So where does this uh, beautiful sunset come from? It comes from a book that I was commissioned by um, you know, William B. Erzman in, um, in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, this religious publishing house. But it's uh, the, the pace down at the very end of the 23rd Psalm. The 21st, 23rd Psalm. What's it? Now, some people call this the, the end paper. Well, it, this is the end paper here. Okay, this uh -huh. is the pace down. So this is actually the pace down and the end paper. That's right. Okay. And it's one spread that goes all the way across. And it, this is the end of the day, and this is the beginning of the day. And that's the beginning of the yeah, day, yeah. of course. And it is set on the island of Antigua, where my wife and I got married. And um, when, I, when I took this commission, I told them that I would take it only on the basis that my shepherd would be an Antiguan boy, a black boy, um, and uh, that it would be set on that island. And the island becomes a, a symbol of, of the earth and the, oh, nice. and the universe and all that sort of thing. And I'm sick and tired of seeing Three little white boys uh, being the shepherd in the in illustrations of the twenty third song. Sure. I wouldn't have anything to do with that. Okay. You might say that there's a political agenda here. And, okay. Well, and that's I think all all life is political in some level. Mm -hmm. um, just to give a sense of a little bit of the interior of the book. Sure. Shadow of the Valley of Death. Valley of the Shadow of Death. Yeah, that's the way you go. So, here we are on the beach and all so, that. So this is watercolor, yes? Yes, watercolor. Transparent so, watercolor. So your mediums are woodcut, printmaking, and watercolor. Well, my, I do make woodcuts, but most of the things that we have here, uh, are the prints are uh, wood engravings, which okay. are very different from a woodcut. Okay, so you're going to explain that to us. Can, can we uh, move on to the next one sure. here? So this is... Um, Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Alice's, well, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, yep. And that would be this one. And uh, we're looking at, um, we're looking at trade edition, not not the original Pennyroyal Press edition. Pen so Roll you Press first edition did your huge. edition. Yes. And then, um, and then which then publisher? Then we sold it to the University of California Press. University of California then just took your whole design and reproduced they it. They just reproduced it, absolutely. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Yes. Yes. So it's the original text of Alice in yes. the Looking Glass by yes. Lewis Carroll. Right. And oh, you have to pay royalties. No. Does it, no? Oh, it's a it's public, public domain? domain? Sure. That's nice. Has been for a long time. Oh, that's very good. And the two images that we have here, can you tell us about them? Well, the first one, I'm not sure which one is up on the screen, now, but Alice in her, uh, it, with her sister, uh, and, and by the with know, the with the, the capital A there, the that's capital a, a, yeah. is that the beginning of the book? That is the beginning. Alice and her sister. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's I can see the shape of the book, can't yeah, I? Pretty much so. Yeah. So that is that is the. This, it's not here. This particular this, book has uh, an extraordinarily wide um, uh, shoulder margin, and the reason it has that is because we have the shoulder notes. And printed in red, and those are explanatory, um, uh, exegetical 
comments on the text. On the text, yeah. okay. Yeah. And, um, okay, but, but, okay, so they changed the format of the book, but when you printed it, it had this rather narrow... No, it looks just exactly like Oh, you had the exactly same... Oh, like oh, this. I said, yeah. okay. I mean, the, this is a reproduction exactly. of the original. Exactly, I got it, okay. Yeah. So the second one, can you tell us about the second one? It's marvelous. I don't remember a king any place in, in Alice story? in Wonderland. I remember a queen, and, and he has a heart on his chest, so he must be the king of hearts. The king of hearts, yeah, who, who comes here. Um, he's at the trial of the, of the knave of hearts. He's the judge. I forgot at the, that. At the, Carl, at, at the trial. And this is one of the things about what Lewis Carroll does to anybody who uh, wishes to illustrate this book. Uh, at the trial, um, he, Lewis Carroll addresses his reader, which is unusual, and says, if you want to see how the king kept the crown on his head, look at the frontispiece. Oh, that's a commitment. Uh, it's, an, it's an instruction. It is an order. I, it, in order to do that, I can't do the book without putting a an frontispiece. image of, as a frontispiece of the king of hearts and also showing, tell, the, give the answer to, to the quiz. And it looks to me like it's it's a hat pin or something yeah. that's holding the, ha the Straight crown. Straight to the skull. Yeah, stuck right in his skull somewhere. And he has one eye that looks quite bug-eyed. Yep. Yep, quiet. Yeah. Looking right at you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so now would be a good time to ask you, what is the difference between... It, tell us how you do wood engravings. And what's the difference between a wood engraving and a wood cut? Well, there are two major differences between the two media. Uh, the first one is that the wood cut, if this were a piece of wood and the tree is growing in this direction, this right here would be the plank grain. That's what you see, you know, in window sills and all that sort of thing. That's the plank. And a wood cut is done in that surface and it's done with open-ended gouges, V-shaped and U-shaped gouges they slip underneath the wood, okay? Uh, wood engraving, on the other hand, is done here on the end grain of the wood, and it is done with a tool like this, which is a solid shaft of very, very sharp steel. May I, may I hold it? Certainly. Don't cut yourself. So, is this your primary tool? I have about 50 of those. With different shapes at the ends? And, yes, exactly. And, and so this is a piece of steel yeah, so that is inserted in a, in a, in a wooden in, handle. In a half wooden handle? Mm -hmm. Well, it has to be half because the, the, when you hold the tool, it's up under the hand like this, up, up right under the, yes. that part of the palm. If, it, if this were fully round, I can't get the block down low enough. Right. Okay, so uh -huh. it has to be flat like that. Um, you also might note that it's wrapped up in. Um, bandage yeah. and that's so my fingers don't get cramped while I'm holding it. Oh. It gets it a little bit bigger, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah. So can you show us the front of this? Sure. So uh, this is not wood. This is not wood. Um, what is it? Wood, when you can find good engraving wood, costs about 30 or 40 dollars a square inch. And I can't find any good wood anymore anyway. I think it's all my fault because I think I used it all up doing Alice and Huckleberry Finn and the Wizard of Oz and Frankenstein. I, I okay. used a, a lot of stuff. Noted. It's all his fault. It's all my fault. Okay. So a man, this is, I, want, I love telling this story because it, this is a material called wood, uh, resin grave. And it was invented by a British guy who was, as a child, his, or as a young man, his hobby was wood engraving. So he retired as a chemical engineer. He retired and decided he was going to go back to engraving, but he found out what people like me already knew, and that's there's not much good wood out there anymore. So, being a chemical engineer, he decided to invent this material, which is called resin grave. It's a cast polymer resin. So, what are we looking at here? Uh, it's an illustration for, um, this block has never been printed, uh, it's an illustration for a, a play. I'm, I think I'm the only one around who's ever illustrated a, a first edition of Mark Twain because this is a play of his, um, I think the title is, Is He Dead? And it's, um, it was a play, and it was discovered only a few years ago, and then University of California Press published it, and I did the illustrations. But, and this is obviously... But what a, are we physically looking at here? 
You're, you're why, the why, do I, why do I see black on it? Do well, you put because, ink on it? Yeah. Oh, well, so yes. you put ink so you can see the results of well, what you're doing? Well, this drawn on, you can tell right here that this material is pure white. Yes. I draw on the white material with black. And yeah. that's what you're seeing, essentially. But before I start engraving, I roll a, a, a toner on top of it, which is a, the rust color. That way, because right now, if I cut into that white, you don't see anything. Right. But if it's toned to a dark rust color, then I cut into that, I see white. Uh -huh. And what I see white is what's going to print white. I cut away everything that's white. Black is what's left up. But you said it was rust. No, the, you don't see the rust here. You, you can just a little bit in I here. See, you can see that, pinkish, yeah. that sort of pinkish color. But the, it, once I do that, I roll the, 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 the toner on it, that rust color ink, the whole block is that color. And, and how do you get the black? I draw it on there to begin with. Oh, I see. So that's left over. I draw over. on there I with see. black ink. I see, I yeah. see, I see, I see. And then I remove everything that's white. Thank you. And Thank then you it's, it's printed like, you know, like a rubber stamp. But in this case now, you don't have to wait to find the end of a piece of wood because this resin is, in fact, the equivalent of that. You don't Oh, it, it, it engraves better than most wood. So if one wants a woodcut look, one really needs a piece of wood. But plank wood is well, easy I to would, find. I would challenge anybody to tell me the difference between one of my wood engravings Oh. And an engraving that's done on resin grave. Well, let's see. What's this done on? Resin grave. Well, you happen to know. How would we know? Oh. You can't. You, you can't, can't tell know. any difference. So I'm looking at these lines here. This is from, what is this from? The Peniel Caxon Bible, the King James Bible. Uh -huh. And this is uh, Abraham. Abraham. And or so I, I can see the lines that you cut that's in right. the background like this. Yes. And these others, all sorts of different yes. action here. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you could not, if you put that under a microscope and compared it to the image of the King of Hearts, you might be able to see a little bit of different texture at the edge of each line, but you would have to have a microscope to do so. Got it. I challenge anybody to I won't, pick out I won't, the I won't take the challenge. I, okay. I believe you. So let's move on. Mm -hmm. This one over here is, is from another book. It's from, it, it's from, from this the book. It's from the second of the Alice books, which is uh, Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. And that is the, the cat is the opening image. I didn't get that I down, I think you did have I? it here. Yeah, right here? Nope. No? Nope, nope, nope. She's the opening, the very beginning, because Alice is with her cat. There's the two eyes that we see, and here is the... And it's a chess itself. set. The cat is looking from behind a chess set? No, just looking from behind a ball of yarn. No, no, this one over on the right. Oh, yes, the, behind the chess set. Yes, exactly. And so the chess set is kind of whimsical too, right? What well, is that? Chess, the, whole, the whole book of uh, Through the Looking Glass is a chess game. And you can, there is, in fact, an image. I don't know where it is right here. It takes some time to find it probably. But there, is, okay. a, there is the chess problem. Uh -huh. that is solved in Looking Glass. So let's go on to these two other. These look like children's books. They yes, look like fables, in fact, or something they, like it. We have these are. two. So we have the hyena. Yeah, Bongo. Bongo the hyena. Bongo. This is a book His, by the it, late Virginia Hamilton, who was the most uh, honored um, children's book writer in American history. She's an um, African-American writer. She won the Hans Christian Andersen Award. She's the only children's book writer ever to win a MacArthur Grant. And her honors just go on and on and on. Okay. She was a good friend. But 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 you were asked to do this book, yes? Yes, indeed. Yes. Yes. You were asked to illustrate this yes, book. Yes, I was. And therefore you designed it as well. And I designed it as well. Do you get to yes. design the cover? I, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. The cover is another issue. Here's Bongo. Um, in the way that works on the page. That's wonderful. Yeah. So when you design uh, the illustrations for a story, you read the story and you take notes along the way. Oh, I need no, an I image never read, here. I never read these things. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> but you, everybody illustrates different scenes. Certain scenes sort of sure. like obvious you need an illustration for, but others are not so obvious. Well, if, there, if I sense that there is an obvious illustration that needs to be done, you can bet your bottom dollar I'm going to avoid it. I got it. Or I'm going to approach it from another direction. I'm going to approach it in a way that nobody else that I know of has ever approached Oh, you like it. a challenge. 
I just don't like to be uh, repetitive. I mean, I'm not, Alice, for instance, I mean, Alice, I, you know, everybody bleeds off of John Tenniel's illustration of the little blonde girl with the, with the Mary Jane shoes. Uh, that would be the last thing I would ever think to do. Uh-huh. All right, these are animals. Yes. This is um, a, 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 a lousy, lousy rotten stinking grapes. It's a, um, it's a riff on the um, uh, sour grapes of, of Ovid. I think it's Ovid. And um, this image is I don't where... Know, I learned them as the Table de la Fontaine. I beg your pardon? Didn't I learn them as the, the La Fontaine fables? No, this is not La Fontaine. This is, um, this is uh, I'm pretty sure it's Ovid. Mm -hmm. so it, I could be very wrong on that. But here's the image and um, a fox explaining to the porcupine and to the beaver and to the bear who is so bored with it he's gone to sleep because this is about the fourth time that fox has tried to dream up some kind of scheme to get up there to get those grapes. Yeah. I like the pencil behind his ear. Yeah. I challenge you to tell me how that pencil stayed there. He got a hole in the back of his head. I see. Good. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and, and these, of course, are watercolors as well. Yes, that's watercolor. And, and if so, you come in on that, that diagram down there, there's all sorts of things going on, you know, wind factors and uh, trajectories and all this sort of thing. It's uh -huh. kind of a, a, a joke in itself. Wonderful. So um, that brings us to, oh, I forgot Emily. Yes. Does she fit in here at some point? Well, Emily would fall somewhere between Alice and... Um, yeah, right after Alice. I think that print mm -hmm. was done in, I don't remember what it was done. Was, it, was it for a book? No, it was not for a book. I believe, if our memory serves, it was commissioned by the Jones Library. Uh-huh, uh-huh. In Amory. I understand you're going to be celebrating your 75th birthday. That's right. And that uh, your gallery, you you have an exclusive at the uh, Richard Michelson well, Gallery. Well, I have a geographical. A geographical ex exclusive. exclusive. Yeah. So in this region, if you want to see Barry Moser's work, the place to go is uh, Richard Michelson's Gallery in Northampton. Yeah. Yeah. And if you haven't been there, you really are in for a great treat. Um, and behind you, um, the two panels behind mm -hmm. you, are two pieces that are so different from what we've been spending most of our time looking at. Can you tell us a little bit about that as the sure. closing? And I also want to bring the attention of the viewer. What I noticed is that we've gone from the ovoids of 1962 62, whatever it is. to this is a circle. <laughs> yes, it is. But it's an ovoid also. Strictly circle. And, um, and, and it's quite, quite different from everything you've done. Mm -hmm. Tell us what the medium is and tell us why you're doing this. Well, these prints behind me are lithographs, and they're the first lithographs I've ever done. And it comes about because I had uh, injured my hand um, a long time ago, and I wasn't able, I, I can't do large scale watercolors anymore because of it. And then uh, just before Christmas 2014, I injured that index finger, seriously injured it in the, in the joint down here. It's finally better. And so I couldn't engrave anymore and I started making lithographs. The, the images themselves are for me a, a return to beginnings in a, in a sense. And that comes about largely because I'm sick to death of subject matter. I just, uh, I am tired of it. I don't, I, want, I don't want to do it anymore. And so I went back to my origins, go back to subject matterless images, which is, of course, uh, not true because there is no such thing as a contentless image. If, it, if you're not having a content, then not having content is your content. Yes. So, uh, but these are totally this, abstract images. These leave, leave the content to my yeah. imagination. That's as exactly well. right. I have a very close friend, Paul Mariani, a great poet, lives up in, um, up in Montague. He's a deeply religious Roman Catholic, and when he looks at these images, he's finding all kinds of subject matter in them that has to do with religion, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the stone of unction and things like that, which they're not there, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But once he sees them, they're there. They're there for him, yeah, yeah. Exactly. or maybe even so. for the rest of us. So. Um, I'm not allowed to call you an artist. I don't care if you do. But, I'm just not calling myself that. Okay. Uh, so are you calling yourself a lithographer now? No, not until I make maybe another dozen lithographs. A dozen? 
Uh, You'll let us know when we can call you a lithographer? I can do it right now if you want to, but make my lithographer friends uh, wince. Wince. Yeah. Yeah. Uh He's he's not old enough yet. Lithography is is a different method. Well, these are plate lithography. Lithography itself, litho, stone, uh, graph to draw, uh, it means drawing on a a lithographic stone, which are mined in, used to be mined in um, Lithuania, I think it is. I forget now. Bavaria, and um, you draw on the stone with a oily base crayon, so it base crayon. So it doesn't take muscle. No, not at all. And then you wet the stone, and then you roll it up with uh, ink where the stone is wet. It rejects the ink where the tush crayon is. It attracts the ink, and then it's scraped off, essentially. But plate lithography is done on aluminum plates. I want to congratulate you on your new career in lithography, <laughs> and also on. Uh, reaching 75 thank you. wonderful years yeah. and also thanking you for the years and years of illustration that you're sick of, I understand, of beautiful objects and beautiful characters and mysterious and wonderful creatures and people and, uh, and just gorgeous work and also lastly for having chosen this area to to um, to make your life and make oh, your career. Thank you. It kind of chose me, but that. Yeah. Well, then we've chosen each other. This afternoon has been with um, a visit with Barry Moser, and uh, you've been watching Talking Art. I'm Jane Trigere, and I'll see you next time with another artist. Thank you very much. <laughs>